Nicholas Sonestorm and dear participants, very good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to the NICE webinar on China's engagement in Europe. Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement is an independent, apolitical, and non-partisan think tank which believes in freedom, democracy, and a world free from conflict. We envision a world where sources of insecurity are identified and understood, conflict are prevented or resolved, and peace is advocated. NICE has four major research centers, China Studies, Neighborhood Studies, Non-Traditional Security Studies, Defense and Security Studies. Similarly, we have eight major research topics, Global Governance, Sustainable Development and Smart Cities, Indo-Pacific Affairs, Climate Change and Energy, Disaster Management, uh, uh, International Economy and Development, China's Belt and Road Initiative, Refugee and Migration, Border and Transboundary Water Politics. China study being one of the major research interests of NICE, we are hosting a series of events on issues related to China with a number of scholars around the world. Today we have senior expert, Dr. Nicholas Swanestrom from Sweden to speak on Chinese engagement in Europe. I was fortunate to meet Professor Swanestrom for the first time at IDS during the Asian Security Conference. Uh, I was in the organizing committee at that time and uh, uh, that was the first time I think met him. Uh, let me formally introduce Dr. Nicholas Swanestrom. Dr. Nicholas Swanestrom is the director and one of the founder of Institute for Security and Development Policy. He's a fellow at the Foreign Policy Institute of the Paul H. Nietzsche School of Advanced International Studies, SIAS, United States, and a guest professor at Lesan Normal University, China. His main area of expertise are conflict prevention, conflict management, and regional cooperation, Chinese foreign policy, and security in Northeast Asia. The Belt and Road Initiative, traditional and security threats, and its effect on regional and national security, as well as negotiations. His focus is mainly on Northeast Asia, Central Asia, and Southeast Asia. Dr. Swanestrom has authored, co-authored, or edited a number of books, including Eurasian Ascent in Energy and Geopolitics, Sino-Japanese Relations, The Need for Conflict Prevention and Management, Transnational Blogistan, uh, I think it's Swedish, which means Transnational Crime, a Security Threat, Regional Cooperation and Conflict Management, Lesson for the Pacific Rim and the Foreign Devils, Dictatorship or Institutional Control, China's Foreign Policy towards Southeast Asia. Dr. Swanestrom holds a PhD in Peace and Conflict Studies from Upasala University. His dissertation dealt with regional cooperation and conflict management in the Pacific Rim. He also holds a licentiate degree from the Department of Peace and Conflict Research that examines the Chinese foreign policy towards South Asia. He holds a master's degree from Upasala University and the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. He has also been a student of, at Beijing Language Institute, Beijing University, and Dalian Language University. Dr. Sonestrom, uh, you'll have roughly around 45 minutes, uh, and then after we'll open the floor for discussion. We'd like to request all our participants to drop questions in the chat box or in the comment box on Facebook Live. Uh, Professor Swanestrom, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much, um, and uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure being here, and thank you, uh, Pramod, for inviting me. Uh, it's a pity I can't actually be in Kathmandu. Uh, I actually spent quite a lot of, I visited uh, Nepal uh, some 20 times in the, uh, during the um, unrest, when we had, a, a, during the, the, the Maoist uh, uh, rebellion, and uh, it was actually, I mean, extremely happy to, to go back, but unfortunately, I haven't been in Nepal for at least six years, I think now. So it's been a long, long time without it. But I'm gonna be, um, try to be fairly short and, and rather have a discussion and, and, um, and take questions. Uh, ISDP, which I head, is a non-governmental organization, uh, independent, and as uh, uh, Professor, Gashwal uh, was saying is that um, uh, we've been focusing a lot on Northeast Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, but primarily China and of course China and Europe becomes an important uh, uh, factor for us. And of course, the, uh, when it comes to Europe and China, uh, I think it's the relationship is changing. Um, we've been talking a lot on if China is positive for Europe and if 
the engagement will continue. And um, the Merricks Institute in Germany did a study um, and they came out to the fact that we might actually be entering a situation where we talk about hot econom economics, uh, sort of engagement in economics, but much more cold relation when it comes to politics. And 60% of all the respondents to the survey would claim that the political climate will worsen between China and Europe. Um, and then the majority thinks the economic climate will remain stable. Uh, very few actually thinks neither would the, the political or economic will improve. But of course, this is it's not an easy question to answer because China is an important actor for, for Europe. Uh, we do have uh, uh, a certain trade dependency on each other, uh, but also, of course, the, the political side and the security side and all that creates tension. And then there's also a divide within Europe um, where we have Eastern Europe, what is uh, and what is termed 17 plus one, has a more positive picture of China, whereas Northern Europe and Western Europe might have a more critical view of China. So when we talk about Europe, I think it's important to understand that Europe is very divided. There's no easy answer, and I'll get back to that. But I think that maybe the biggest weakness uh, in Europe-China policy is not really anything to do with China, it's really about what the Europeans have failed to do. But I think the, the biggest challenge we're facing is the, the normative differences. Um, Europe, and especially then the Western part of Europe, have very, uh, sort of democracy, human rights, free speech and all that, uh, which in many times clashes with the Chinese perception. And of course, the Chinese claim that we should leave politics aside and deal with economics and we shouldn't criticize each other and all that. But of course, the basis of a democracy and a, and a transparent and open society is the ability and necessity to criticize, well, your own government, but also, of course, uh, companies and uh, other governments that you, you, for example, trade with. And Europe has shifted. We, we do talk about the China as a strategic competitor. Um, what we talk about is the, the differences in system. And I, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about this, uh, or you can ask questions. But the, the problem is, of course, that Europe is doing a lot of talk. Uh, for example, now with the European China meetings, um, we see that the wording that comes out of Europe tends to be quite strong. But the question, the next one is, what do we do now? What is the next step? And, and I think that that's where Europe fails a bit. We, we don't have a strong China policy. We don't have uh, a very strong foreign policy at all. I mean, it's more individual states. And China has been very successful in dividing that. And I think that's the, um, the problem we're going to face. And um, we also see that uh, in, the, in the traces of COVID-19 and how China has been utilizing that to sell its own uh, sort of model, um, even in, in democracies. Um, but... When it comes to economic integration, of course, uh, the um, China-European trade is, is quite impressive. China's share of uh, Europe's trade is 10.5% in 2017. So 10% of the total trade is, is uh, quite uh, uh, impressive. And uh, what we have is, is really sort of a almost, we, we, Europe is selling to China for two, a bit more than 200 billion. China is almost up to 400 billion in trade to Europe. It's a trade deficit. And I'll, I'll t say that immediately. I don't actually think the trade deficit in itself is a problem. Uh, if China is managing to trade 
uh, and sell to Europe and we buy more from them than we buy from uh, they buy from us that's fair the problem of course is really the equal access the level playing field and I'll, I'll get back to that but the actual uh, difference in, in trade I, I don't think should be a problem but what we have now is that uh, uh, Europe is China's largest trading partner. China is our second largest trading partner. Uh, but when I also mention that 10.5% of uh, EU's trade is, is Chinese, 65.3% of Europe's trade is intra-European. So yes, we do have a dependency on China, but I think it's important to realize that we do have, most of our trade is inter-European. Uh, so we're not in that sense dependent on, on China exclusively. What, what is the problems? Well, as I sort of mentioned, transparency. We have a enormous problem with the lack of transparency in, in, um, with China and, and trade. And of course, with the political and security establishment, but uh, primarily with, with the trade. Equal access, there's been European companies and, um, well, the European companies has been severely restricted in China. That has slightly improved and there's been a demand, but the equal access is lacking. So we're not really having a level playing field when it comes to trade and of course China says that this is they will do this and they will do this and they will do this and they've been saying that for many many years but there's not really any change happening and I think that this is something the Europeans are realizing that China is not changing to the extent that we would like to do and then of course we have the intellectual theft um, China has been severely criticized for that um, that has been the problem. Uh, this continues to be a problem, but I think it was more of a problem earlier than today, simply because China is moving forward uh, quite rapidly. Um, there are other problems with uh, China's um, cyber dimension, and I'll, I'll deal with that. But then it's also the economic reforms. Uh, there's been a quite distinct demand from Europe that China should reform its economy um, to better suit free trade. That has not happened. And of course, this is a sovereign state, they can do what they want. But the repercussions, of course, is that if we're not having a level playing field and we don't have the same um, com conditions for competitions, uh, Europe needs to rethink uh, really what you want to do with China. And, um, and then there's uh, market versus um, governments. This is actually, from my point of view, maybe the, the biggest problem uh, that we see is that uh, Chinese companies is to a large extent controlled by um, the Chinese government. And uh, this is not only state-owned enterprises, but if you look at the Chinese statistics, uh, 1,877, this is domestic statistics, 1,877 million non-public enterprises has party organizations within them. That's 73.1% of all non-public en uh, enterprises. And this is under document number 11 on uh, strategy and uh, uh, improving uh, building in the non-public and, and well, I need to get back to that, translating in the Chinese. Uh, but uh, so the, in, in uh, 2012, March 2012, the Chinese government implemented a document that made China's Chinese companies establish these companies to have a better control and of course as a free e uh, economy party control and government control of a company is, is a problem and i think this is something that uh, will have to change and of course this is also if you 
you have companies controlled by governments and they invest in critical infrastructure, that will be a problem. And then of course we come into the Huawei problem um, with 5G, uh, should you allow governments to control critical infrastructure in your countries? And I would be less optimistic about that. So we see a lot of challenges that, that comes in. And I, I think that um, the changes that we see in China is, is hardly enough to level that playing field. And I think that what we're gonna see is a much more restrictive engagement with China. And this is actually something important to look at because uh, what, what are we, what's gonna happen in the future? Already now we do see a lack or a decrease of um, Chinese foreign directments in Europe. And from 2016, um, there's been a drop. Partly because China is controlling their own assets more clearly. They want to make sure that they invest in, in domestic companies and, and reinvest it in China, which is understandable. We're facing a economic uh, downturn, not least after COVID-19. But it also more major control mechanism from Europe. Europe has lifted the challenge of being dominated or controlled by Chinese capital. So there's, there are restrictions coming in that would severely limit Chinese foreign direct investments in, in Europe. And um, which is not necessarily a, a bad thing. Uh, when we're looking at this, and I, we're also looking at most of the investments in, uh, in Europe is really acquisitions, where the Chinese companies by already established companies. And then very little comes in in so-called greenfield investments where they're starting up new companies, which from, from my point of view, of course, is a clear indication that they're, they're buying up technology, they're buying up market access. Um, and those investments are a bit problematic. We, when we talk about 17 plus one and we talk about economic uh, investments, there's a lot of discussion about that China is taking over Eastern Europe. Um, there's, um, there's a discussion that the Chinese investments in Eastern Europe uh, is of critical importance and all that. The reality, of course, is very different. And I think that um, this is a part of this sort of exaggeration problems. Uh, the foreign direct investment in Europe is only 1.5% of Chinese investment in EU in 2018. Uh, Southern Europe, Italy, Spain, Portugal is 13%. The bulk of investments goes into Northern Europe, Germany, UK, Sweden, France. And this is sort of modern technology. And uh, so there's, there's a not only the drop in investments uh, from China, but the investments we see is primarily targeting uh, a few relatively developed economies, as I said, Germany, Sweden, uh, et cetera. Uh, so th I think the, the situation looks a bit different, but I belong to the people who is more skeptical, and I think that trade probably run into a number of major challenges. Huawei, of course, being one of these issues we need to look at. Uh, and very much to the, uh, for the reason of transparency and state control. But outside of um, economy, and economy will be complicated, um, is China and, and Europe on the same field? Do we, do we play the same game? Well, I mean, there, there's a lot of clashes between Europe and China. When we talk about human rights, for example, we talk about Tibet, uh, which of course you know better than anyone as a neighboring region. Xinjiang, rule of law, Hong Kong, Taiwan, all of those issues comes up. 
and these are very important issues for Europe and uh, especially then for uh, North and, and Western Europe. And here we do clash significantly with China. And Europe, European Parliament put up a resolution now who calls for the support and formation of international contact group in Hong Kong, calls for the insertion of the human rights clause in any EU-China trade talks, support for the, the creation of a UN special envoy for Hong Kong. So that's one example of when Europe is taking a very tough position on what is, of course, internal issues of China, but with, with in, uh, international repercussions. And I think that's good. I think Europe should take that position. The problem is what happens after they written this, when they said this, how do they follow up? And I think that uh, Europe is tremendously weak in a lot of its um, actions. Not necessarily the wording might be correct and all well and fine, but the actual implementation will be more problematic. One thing we do agree on is WTO reforms. Uh, EU and China both strongly support WTO. Um, EU wants to work closer with uh, China on WTO and uh, including, for example, strengthening industrial subsidies uh, reform and etc. So here we do have an example of uh, where we do agree and the same with climate change. China now has 28% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. It's become a crucial partner in the Paris Agreement for Europe. And I think these are areas we do find a, um, a cooperation. So, I mean, this is not black or white. China is a actor that is going to create a lot of, um, stir a lot of feelings. But the solution is not to disengage with China or fully engage with China. The, the whole thing is to get a balance that works really well. So we, when we talk about that, I mean, the, and, and that's part of the normative uh, pieces. Um, and then, of course, we, we do have a lot of pressure on um, think tanks, uh, politicians, media, all that from China. Uh, I don't think there's any think tank who has not been exposed to pressure, including ourselves. Um, and that's part of that sort of um, uh, part of the problem, because not only will it trigger more anti-Chinese feelings um, or anti-PRC feelings, as you say, uh, but it would also force the governments to take a tougher uh, position regarding China. One thing that Europe is not very good at is uh, defense cooperation. We do have uh, PESCO, the Permanent um, Structured Cooperation. And I'm actually uh, relying here on a scholar from Brand, Scott, uh, Scott Harold. Uh, what we have is the beginning of a intra-European cooperation. And of course, China is really concerned if the PESCO structure will cooperate with NATO. Will this be an extension of the something that is directed to China, or will China be able to manage uh, uh, the uh, military cooperation? And China has had military exercises with Russia in the Baltic Sea, which is, of course, as a Swede, extremely problematic. And of course, needless to say, for the, the Baltic states. Um, but the this, this security cooperation in Europe is still in, in the early stages. And a lot of the Chinese critics is not too concerned because they think that Europe is not getting their act together. Uh, unfortunately, I think they're correct in many ways. Um, Europe would need to focus much more on its military cooperation. And if if we would be able to secure such sort of military cooperation, I think it would be more NATO leaning. Um, there's a discussion in Europe uh, whether 
Europe should be sitting on the fence, balancing United States versus China, or if you take a, take a clear stand, then of course, personally, I'm, I'm sort of a transatlanticist, so I don't see the, the, the problem. I will get back to that when the United States in the end, but um, when it comes to military cooperation, I don't really see much um, substance. It's like the quad, it looks very nice, but um, getting India, Australia, Japan, United States to collaborate is, is a different cup of tea than just having the, the, the formal agreements. But talking about military security, we come into, I think, one of the more challenging aspects of the relationship, uh, cybersecurity. Uh, well, before I go into cybersecurity, I should also mention the, the Arctic, because the Arctic is a, China defines itself as a near Arctic region or a near Arctic country. And um, there was a bit of a hope in the early days that um, the Nordic countries could collaborate with China on uh, the, the um, sort of the Arctic region and especially when it comes to environment and all that, um, it seems more and more unlikely that we will find a, a cooperative structure. However, of course, um, China is not a military actor. They don't control the Arctic. Uh, it's primarily Russia, uh, of course, who is the most important uh, actor in the region. But there has been a bit of cooperation scientifically and um, environmentally with China or in the Arctic. And I think that on general, it's been positive, even if we do see a number of sort of tension lines developing. Well, when it comes to cybersecurity, I think that sort of exemplifies the difference between Europe and China. And when I say Europe, I also, of course, um, there's a distinction here between Western and Northern Europe, which is um, uh, dem dem very clear democracies, who, and, um, and then Eastern Europe, which is, of course, democracies, but they uh, sometimes been leaning towards and um, sort of non-democratic uh, measures. In the European context, the individual is in the prime position. When we talk about security of the uh, cyber security, we talk about security for the individual. How do we guarantee security for the individual? How do we minimize government control over information and access to individuals? And on the Chinese side, it's very much different. How does the government control individuals? Um, so for me, that sort of exemplifies in, in essence the relationship between Europe and China. Government versus individual. Um, and what we've seen is a tremendous rise of Chinese cyber operations in, um, in Europe. And I'm absolutely convinced we've seen operations in China by, by the Americans, by the Europeans and all that. But um, it's been to the extent that it's been a problem, uh, that computers like my own is more and more of a sort of open access uh, computers right now. And that sort of pressure has been, been increasing. And um, we see that Chinese organizations has been much more um, active in pressuring uh, politicians, media. And, uh, and this has been the part of the, I think the, the, the growing tension. But aggressiveness is actually quite striking. And here, of course, there are scholars um, who see a greater cooperation between Russia and China in Europe when it comes to cyber operations. For European, that sort of is a red light because Russia has traditionally been our biggest concern. And now we design a Russian cooperation, especially then in cyber, the cyber area, but also in other areas. Uh, it adds to the tension and it adds to a bit of the, uh, the problem we see. Well, 
if I'm going to start trying to wrap it up here in 10, 15 minutes, what is then the way forward? Well, I think that we, what we see is uh, China will continue to be a strategic competitor when it comes to values and norms. I don't see China changing into a transparent and open democracy. On the other hand, I, I, I don't see Europe either. Not individual countries has been um, moving a bit away from uh, full fledged democracies to a bit more totalitarian. Uh, but in general, I think that um, the values and norms in Europe are very strong and will continue to be so. That clash will clash with China. Um, EU, though, needs to get its act together. EU is the weakest in this link. I, I can't even blame China for wanting to influence governments, they wanted to influence, to buy up com key companies. What I can blame is really that Europe is not doing what they should to prevent that. But Europe is, is getting, needs to get its act together. Taking one case of example is the Piraeus port, uh, which was, China was criticized for buying up. And I think that, that that was a failure of Europe because when that was sold, there was no bidders. There was only Chinese companies. They had the best bid, and in the second round, they were the only bidder. So if Europe is concerned with China's rise, China, they need to have a strategy that is more effective. So we can't put the blame only on China. We also need to figure out what Europe can do to, to deal with that. Politics and security, I, I see increasingly clashes. Um, I think that we're going to see a closer cooperation with uh, democratic states such as Japan, uh, United States, Australia. Uh, well, after the recent debacle in, 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 uh, in, the, uh, in um, Himalayas, maybe India, and, and so on. So, I mean, I see rather a polarization when it comes to politics and security. International aid, disaster relief, environmental cooperation, I see China as a, competitor, as, as a partner. I think these are areas that we can actually build some sort of cooperation. So again, this is not a question of saying I, either or. Talk, people talk about delinking from China and it's, uh, it's impossible to de-link from any large economy into, in, this, in this world. What we need to, to figure out is what is our core values? What do we need to protect? What do, how do we do go about that? And economy, of course, the, um, is more problematic. Um, as the economy is, well, partly political and partly economic, um, I think Europe needs to put up clear regular rules, what they want to accomplish, but also to enforce whatever they decide. And I think that what China has done is really to have sort of salami slicing uh, tactic where they push forward and you can get, and then they pull, pull back, but they cut a few slices of the salami on the way. So they gain uh, turf all the time. And it, Europe has been very weak. And I think that's what, um, when the United States criticizes Europe for not acting, I, th I think the Un United States is partly correct because we have not been able to formulate and stand up to the, the values and ideas we would like to have. But then when I, when I mentioned the United States, I need to say that, I mean, I, I assume that would be a question otherwise. Is the not United States the same as China or even worse? With Donald Trump at the power, wouldn't you be more concerned with, China, with United States than China? Isn't this double standard? You're, you're being tough on China, but not on the United States. Well, there are a few differences. Taking Trump in or out of the equation, uh, Europeans 
have a bit of an issue with him um, generally, not everyone. But what is the big difference is that United States is a democracy. It's a transparent society where media controls, media criticizes, media looks into it. Um, we also have a very transparent economic system. That means that if United States do business with Europe, transactions are visible. There's no deals um, that are allowed to be, be done without uh, being backed in, in, in legislation. And there's a judicial freedom. I mean, we, the courts are independent of the government. So when we talk about United States, and you can criticize the United States for a lot, and you can criticize Europe for a lot, um, but the political system in the United States and the, the media freedom and the way that the government is continuously criticized sort of opens up for that difference between the United States and China. So I mean, uh, for me, it's, it's, it's not possible to compare China to the United States. And this is not only because of the historical reason, but simply because of the transparency in the system and the, the checks and balances that the United States have, that sort of as a European, we can always rely on. Um, that's not said that um, Europe should follow the United States in all cases. When it comes to an environment, for example, I think China is a much better partner. Uh, when it comes to military security cooperation, I think, of course, the United States is much better. So I think we're going to see a much more divided policy from Europe, where we're going to be working both with China and the United States. But that said, I mean, the United States will be and will continue to be our preferred partner. And I stopped there, and I think I was came up to 40 minutes, so I will... Uh, Pramod will tell me if I... <laughs> uh, we have lots of questions, so maybe we'll uh, move immediately to the questions. Sure. Uh, the first question is, in the face of US-China rivalry, what role can Europe or European Union play? How will the rivalry impact Europe if the rivalry develops into a Cold War? Uh, I'll put three or four questions. Yeah. Uh, second is, can China replace Europe with America as its trusted partner in the West? And there is a similar question that how far EU is possible to develop a relation with China regarding EU's close relation in security with the United States? There is a third question on Belt and Road. Does the increasing engagement activity of China around the globe, such as Belt and Road, generate a fear of a strategic instability to US? How far is it possible for EU to develop its relation with China regarding EU, European Union closed relations in security with the United States. And there is a similar question. Does the increasing engagement activity of China around the globe, such as Belt and Road, generate a fear of strategic investment in the United States? So these are the three set of questions for the first round. Okay. Um, well, I think that, um, I mean, what can Europe do in, in a, in a if the rivalry between the United States and uh, China. First of all, I don't think there's going to be direct military war between them. There might be skirmishes, there might be clashes in the South China Sea, for example. There might be proxy wars, but I, I, I think that both actors will refrain from having a military conflict. But what can Europe do? Well, Europe can actually, uh, is interested in having a more long-term economic cooperation. I, in one way, Europe could actually use this to put pressure both on the United States and China. The United States to engage more multilaterally, to deal with the environmental issues that we are extremely concerned about, uh, but also maybe to force China to, to make the real changes that it needs to be done. Um, but I don't really see China being able in any way to replace the uh, United States. And as I said, it's, it's, it, it's not a democracy. It's, um, it is a country that uh, is controlled by the party structure. 
uh, it uses immense pressure against individuals and organizations. I mean, all of that is unacceptable. Uh, and and uh, with all the flaws of Europe and United States um, and all states, no state is a perfect state, um, we are much more similar than China can ever be. So I, I don't see that. And when it comes to security, I, uh, my strategy is really to, well, I think the European strategy is if we succeed in building military structures in Europe, that will lean on NATO. The big question is, will we manage to build a security cooperation? And I think that's where the challenge comes in for Europe. Um, the failure of engaging uh, ourselves in a military cooperation. I'm not overly optimistic, but I hope that we will be able to do so. But until then, I think, of course, NATO is the, um, the, the single, the, the only security organization that Europe can rely on. So for me, it's, it's um, cooperates with China to a certain extent, absolutely, but no further. And the same with the United States, conflict to a certain extent, but not further. So we have, uh, there's a limit to it uh, in, in both cases. Uh, when it comes to the Belt and Road Initiative and all that, I mean, for us, it's, again, it comes down to the fact that it's about transparency. We want to understand what China is doing in these individual countries. We want to make sure that the Belt and Road Initiative is not a tool to influence governments, to pressure governments to change. I mean, I don't know if this is the, the latest rumors I heard in Nepal that one of the villages now has been forcibly well, integrated into China. Uh, what can Nepal do? Not much, probably. Uh, and this is the same concern here. I mean, if you suddenly criticize this China for its actions in Hong Kong, the Uyghur human rights, will they cut trade? Will they threaten to do something? So the Belt and Road Initiative could potentially be a very, very positive um, initiative. And I, I think that trade is, a, uh, it doesn't automatically lead to peace, but at least it doesn't hurt it. Uh, but if it's controlled by government, it is a government agenda that runs it, it's much more problematic. So all of this is really, I mean, a, a quite large skepticism when it comes to the possibilities of cooperation between Europe and China at this moment. China has been becoming much more assertive and, and what we would see, say aggressive. Uh, the whole wolf warrior diplomacy that comes up, that the, the diplomats are becoming more aggressive. Um, under Xi Jinping. I mean, before Xi Jinping, I definitely saw a more open and transparent China. No way perfect, but it was moving in an extremely interesting direction. Uh, that direction has gone missing now. So for me, it's, um, yeah, I, 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 I see limitations rather than possibilities at this moment. I hope I answered all three questions there. Did I miss anyone? No, no, it's a common. Let me go to the second round of questions. How will EU-China relations transform in a post-pandemic scenario with the tarnishing image of China in the world order? Second is, many countries are boycotting Huawei for their 5G program. How is Europe reacting to it? Is there a US-China rivalry on this issue? Uh, what is the European public view on China's Uyghur issue? Well, uh, well EU-China and a sort of post-pandemics. Um, it, 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 it is interesting because the pandemics put um, some interesting focus on Chinese diplomacy. Um, when the pandemic started in uh, Wuhan, Europe sent a lot of aid. Nothing was made very public. It was, you know, 
China suffered, we as a good citizen, uh, world citizen should provide assistance. Now when China um, came in and gave aid to Europe, they make a big fuss about it. It was a big thing. And they tried to create sort of that sort of, um, we have come to save and, 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 and uh, rescue uh, the Europeans who, of course, did everything wrong. Uh, so they're trying to politicize the pandemic. And of course, the Chinese criticizes the, the West for politicizing the pandemic. pandemic. I think what's going to happen after the pandemic is a realization that China is politicizing mostly everything. And there's going to be a more careful positioning when it comes to critical products, uh, such as we had masks and we had, you know, all of this that China did provide us, they did assist us. We're going to probably have a much larger indigenous production. So I think what, we, what this might actually trigger, and I, I hope it triggers, and this is not only about China, I hope that Europe will develop its own domestic production of critical products. Europe cannot rely on free trade when it comes to products that could be important in our own security. So the, I think this will change a bit of the European mentality. Free trade might not be the answer to everything. Free trade is important, but uh, maybe we need to also to look at our own, own security and our, our own internal production. I mean, Huawei is, is a problem, and it, there's not a one European position. Uh, Europe is worried about Huawei, but some countries have been more ex open to letting um, Huawei in. Um, others have been more critical. Uh, in Sweden, there's legislation now saying that uh, each individual case will be judged. We don't really point out Huawei, but uh, of course Huawei is one of the actors that we will be more critical against. Um, I think it's problematic. Um, I think that uh, to have a foreign infrastructure in, in G5, 5G in, in Europe is a problem regardless where it's from, especially when it comes to a non-democratic state. And the solution of course would be to, to build on the expertise we have and try to de develop a European um, technology around it. And of course, United States is pressuring Europe to disregard Huawei. This is also a NATO issue. Um, if you use Huawei in a NATO member country, that creates problems for exchange of information and all of that. So for me, it's, uh, it is a problem uh, that I think we can have a very European solution to. We're going to be very tough, and then we're going to allow Huawei to a certain extent. They're going to be allowed into the system, but not the critical infrastructure. The problem, of course, with, with uh, 5G is that every aspect of the system is critical. Um, so for me, I, I see a, a problem with this. And again, this is not necessarily only about Huawei. This is uh, all external companies uh, overall. The Uyghur issue is a disgrace. Um, I think that Europe has not really reacted very strongly on it. Um, what we see is um, that China has been treating its own citizens extremely harsh. We see uh, re-education camps and all that. Um, but it's been notably silent in it. And um, maybe because it's, they're, they're, they are Muslims, I don't know. But uh, I think Europe could have taken a much stronger position. Um, 
and actually asking for and pressuring China to to end sort of this uh, these camps. This is of course not no reason for you know demanding uh, you know a free free country for the, for uh, for the Uyghurs or anything like that. But it's it's about making sure that human rights are fulfilled, and that impacts trade. It impacts engagement. If you if you work with a government that well torture imprisons its own population to that extent or specific groups of its population you need to reassess your your engagement but i think that this is uh maybe one of the areas where europe has failed quite significantly uh, unfortunately we will move to the third round of question and it is very similar to what you talked about health diplomacy how are China's response to COVID-19 in Europe in terms of health diplomacy? Was China active in Europe in assisting to fight the COVID-19? Second is, do China's nationalist narrative impact Europe in terms of bilateral trade? And third is, are there many BRI projects in Europe? What would be the fate of such Chinese projects post COVID-19 in Europe? Uh, so, what will be the imp uh, post COVID 19? Sorry, I missed that. The last question. Last question is health diplomacy. Like what yeah. China said uh, briefly earlier, but what are the response of China when it comes to health diplomacy? Second, on uh, China's nationalist narrative, what will be the impact on bilateral trade? And third, uh, future of BRI projects in Europe. Well, the, the health diplomacy is, um, I mean, it, it looked it looked quite successful initially, but um, when I speak to people and I, you know, you, you talk to both researchers, you talk to politicians, um, it doesn't look very successful because what they do is they they give with one hand, uh, one hand and beat you with the other one, and 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 this is the I think a challenge that um, the Chinese hasn't really sort of grown accustomed to um, there's rather it's created a reaction that never again we we, uh, we need to make sure that we can act independently on this so the health diplomacy um, however sort of positive it was sort of I think backfired on China it really sort of taught us that reliance on China in this particular uh, question is not good. And, um, and that we, we've seen that in other cases too, where, where you have ambassadors saying, if you do A or B, that might impact trade, it might impact this. So having that, realizing that if we suddenly would criticize China for whatever, and they say, well, that will impact trade that could impact your health, uh, cooperation with us, etc. So it, it has, you know, bizarrely really sort of came around the other way. But as most things, if you believe China is a good guy or good country, you have a much more positive view on health diplomacy. And if you're more critical, you see the negative aspects of it. And the reality, of course, there are positive aspects of it and they are negative. But I think that post COVID-19, we will see a um, more intra-European cooperation. And I think we will strengthen that in, in, the, in the light of uh, what happened uh, with China. The nationalist narrative, absolutely, this, this will impact trade. Uh, first of all, I think China will limit it because we're facing an economic downturn. China will focus on building Chinese production. They will focus on Chinese workers. They will not focus on um, foreign direct investments, but rather to what can you do domestically. Uh, but also the very aggressive nationalist narrative we see today in China 
creates repercussions. I mean, I, I know a lot of people who refuse to buy Chinese products today. They will look at the, the shirt and say, okay, made in China, I'm not buying it. Very much due to that sort of nationalist uh, narrative that we see. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it, it is the, it will definitely come up. And I see that um, post COVID-19, there's even a, a bigger uh, sort of uh, nationalist surge in, in China. And as the economy in China slows down, if you can't build a prosperous society, that's well, like China is prosperous and China's economy is developing quickly, but it's not developing as quickly as before. Um, and it's developed very quickly still in Shanghai, but maybe not in Hunan or Hebei or you know, other poorer provinces. Nationalism is the food when you can't grow at the speed that uh, could sort of silence the population. So I think that this is definitely one of the areas uh, that will accelerate the clash between China and Europe. Um, but it also depends on how well Europe is doing. I think we, if the European economy is going really bad, uh, there might be countries that are, that deem themselves to be dependent on Chinese investments and Chinese trade they might be more forgiving for that nationalist narrative and others might be more critical. So I just like to stress once more that Europe is very divided. There's no single Europe. We have um, many Europes <laughs> and many times there are also divisions within the countries. Take Southern Italy, Northern Italy, two different perception of China. Uh, so, for me, it, it is um, a growing challenge, and I, I definitely think that we're going to see that um, coming up. And I, I, I do hope that we will not have a clash between China and Europe, but I definitely hope to see a more constructive cooperation with the United States and Europe, and that will maybe have repercussions on China and, and uh, sort of the post-COVID-19 uh, uh, scenario. That said, I, I do hope that um, I can only wish that American president was more predictable. It's very difficult to collaborate with the United States with a president that um, you never know how they're going to act. So I, uh, I don't envy my European co colleagues and par uh, politicians because yeah, working with Trump cannot be an easy task. Okay, let's go to uh, the third round. How is China using the media in Europe, especially in Central and Europe, Eastern Europe, as part of China's global PR strategy? How would you see Nepal between India and China? Is it still a buffer state or do you see different picture? How could you relate the potential benefit to Nepal from Chinese involvement in Europe? Third is, can China take advantage of the currently strained transatlantic relations? Um, well, to start with the last question, uh, yes, China is taking a lot of advantage of the strained relations with Europe and the United States. Um, it is, um, the relations with the United States has probably not been as problematic in a very, very long time. Um, and it gives, I mean, take the environment as one example. Uh, when the uh, United States le left the Paris Agreement, the, the cooperation with uh, China became logical and uh, they were seen as the good guys. And I think that if China has been maybe playing this a bit differently, um, they could have been seen as uh, a very, very constructive and engaging actor that Europe should build long-term relations with. But unfortunately, they took a different path. 
Um, but there's only so much they can do to drive a wedge between the United States. So the transatlantic re relations and link is problematic now, but it still is a long-term perspective on it. I mean, I, I cannot see, with a new president, I definitely see, a, let's say Biden would win. Uh, I think we're moving back to old relations between the United States and Europe. Uh, with changes, of course, but uh, nevertheless. Uh, Trump in a second period, oh, God knows. Uh, your guess is as good as mine there, but, um, and of course, China will take advantage of that. But I think also when you speak to State Department, you speak to Pentagon, you speak to the Ministry of, uh, well, all ministries in the United States, there's a consistency in it, despite the president's personal uh, views. Uh, I think most Europeans and most Americans view the transatlantic relationship as, as something long-term and good. The media strategy, they've been very, I don't know, I can't say uh, how this comes about, but the Chinese media strategy in Central and, and Eastern Europe, and it also to a certain extent in, in Western Europe, is very similar to the Russian strategy. The question, of course, is the Russians learning, uh, have they been teaching the Chinese or the Chinese learning sort of ad hoc as they go along? But it's very aggressive, very sort of, uh, they threaten on a regular basis. We have journalists who have been um, uh, feeling a lot of insecurity. And of course, in, in, a, in a society where we think press freedom is absolutely essential. If you don't have a free press and a free academia, well, then you're in a very slippery slope. Um, this has been a problem. Some European states, I should say, is less concerned over this. <laughs> there are some European states that might be more inclined of limiting the, the, the free press and free speech, uh, unfortunately. But that's, I think, is an inter-European problem that we need to deal with. But overall, initially, the Chinese strategy was quite successful. But now it's been backlashing. Because now there's been more of a coordinated uh, take on Chinese pressure on media and, and, and non-governmental institutions. So once you can trace a pattern, that's actually sort of negative. Nepal, I mean, I should ask you almost. <laughs> uh, for me, Nepal has a very problematic position. I mean, in one way, it could be a very positive environment. Um, being sandwiched between two of the greatest powers in the world and definitely two, the two largest uh, in population. Um, I know, of course, that there are tension with India and have been so for, for, for a long, long time. Let's be honest, I mean, the Nepali helped the British curb some rebellions in Brit <laughs> colonial India and uh, but, um, and it's been sort of the, the, um, the Indian uh, minority in the southern part of Nepal. There, there's, of course, a very problematic relationship here. And, and then we have China in the northern part, who is now annexing territory and, and, and being... Uh, so I think Nepal has ended up between a rock and a hard place. And um, of course, the... Um, what Nepal needs to do, of course, is try to uh, balance these two interests, maybe without too much consideration who the actors are. Uh, but I think what Nepal should do is really look for a third neighbor. 
uh, to reach out to countries outside of your immediate neighbors, such as Europe, such as Japan, such as um, to balance. I think that's the, the, the probably the greatest or the most likely uh, strategy that could lead to success. But um, this, I, I do not really see how Nepal can turn the current situation into gold. Because um, despite the fact that India and China are on a, in a confrontation st stage, um, neither will really allow the other to, to influence too much. And, uh, and of course, Nepal did in the early days try to balance India with China. Um, and now, of course, the, the, you harvest the fruit from that. But at the same time, letting India in is not politically feasible for, for, for many reasons, historically, ethnically, and all that. Um, so for me, it, it really is about expanding and, and, and inviting third neighbors. That said, India and China will always be the two most important actors for, 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 for Nepal. Um, and I cannot see Nepal, and I, if I were a Nepalese politician, I would not pick side. Europe can pick a side because we're not neighboring. But uh, I think for Nepal, neutrality and long-term engagement with all the actors is the most essential. So, I mean, and it, this is exactly what Nepal is trying to do. So there's nothing new on this one. <laughs> okay, we'll go with the last two questions. Uh, European Union is not dependent with China, but the member like Greece are dependent with China. Do you think uh, it will lead to EU disintegration or does China have any such intention or a strategy, a strategies? The last question is, can India become an alternative for China for Europe on economic or political engagement? I, I think India can be, I'll start with the last one first there. I think India definitely could be a supplement to China. Um, I don't want to sort of disregard China in any way. I mean, uh, I think a prosperous China uh, is, is, is good for the world. Um, I, you know, would like to see it develop in a different political direction, but, um, but definitely India is one of the, when it comes to high technology and all that, it's, it's an interesting telecommunication. There's an interesting actor. And, Absolutely, India could definitely supplement China to a large extent. Um, but India still have a long way to go before it reaches uh, where China is today. And um, so maybe even as Indian European cooperation in, in the strategic areas would be something that would be commendable. But I think we also have to be realistic and say that um, to create what China has created with, with the poverty alleviation, with the economic growth and all that, it's been a tremendous success. And I think that um, for India to repeat what China has done, uh, it's gonna be difficult. Um, so yeah, a supplement, but not uh, a replacement, I, I would definitely see. Well, it, it is interesting. I mean, when, when as, as I said, 65% of the tr trade in Europe is interregional. Even if you look to Gre Greece, I don't have the exact figure here, but it still is by, by far the most important actor for Greece is Europe. Um, when it comes to trade, it comes to tourism, it comes to everything. So, sure there are certain countries such as Greece that have a higher dependency on China, but nevertheless, it's a fragment of the European. So when you look at what actually Europe puts into Greece in terms of economic support, road construction, all of this, the Chinese investment in Greece is 
yeah, is it negligible? The problem Europe has is to make sure that they make this apparent. Even if you look at non-European countries along the border of Europe, the biggest investor in these, most of these countries, I should say, are Europe, is Europe. Second is United States. I mean, some is to Russia, but rarely China is that important. But what they do is they project themselves to be a critical actor. And of course, if you take away the Chinese investment from, from Greece, they will run into economic problems. But if you take away the, the European support to Greece, it won't survive. So there's a distinction here. So, so maybe, first of all, Europe needs to be better in telling people what they do. Europe needs to be better at telling people what they expect from their own collaboration partner and, and member states. Uh, and maybe Europe needs to have a strategy. If we don't want China, if we don't want the United States, if we don't want Russia, whoever, to invest in a particular country or a sector, then Europe needs to be ready to pay. And I think this is where we, we not, we criticize China for investing, but if there's no alternatives, I don't think we should criticize. So here I'm actually not criticizing China because, well, if we, if we don't want to invest, uh, investors in harbors, then Europe should go in and, 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 and uh, invest in it. Then European Union should say, this is a critical infrastructure. Here we need to protect our own European sovereignty. But if that is not in place, well, then China sh should be able to do what they're doing. So I mean, in many of these things, I'm not actually criticizing China as much as I'm criticizing Europe. And I'm actually a, a pro-European. I, I would like to see more integration. I'm not one of these people who see less integration. I think uh, a unified Europe is the only countermeasure we have against external influence. And that can be so Russia, China, United States, or whatever you want. Individually, European eco economies are small, but brought together, we're the largest economy in the world. So, I mean, I think the, the integration is, is, uh, is more important than anything else. Uh, thank you, Dr. Swanestrom, for your time and interesting presentation. It was really a great learning experience about China's engagement in Europe. We'd love to engage in the future on issues of mutual interest and hope to see you in real in Nepal or in New Delhi very soon. Uh, I hope thank you for your time. We'd also like to thank our participants for their presence. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day.